Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Content warning for this episode, it does include child death, sadly. Did you read the article I wrote about the guy who ate, like, two bags of peppermint lozenges yes. like, every day for, like, a couple years? Yes, and then he... <laughs> he got a rash, I think, is what eventually he went to the hospital for. He's like, I have a weird rash, and they're like, that is a weird rash. So the reason why I've been doing cough drops mm -hmm. is it hurts to cough and it also hurts to blow my nose. Mm -hmm. And I get a stuffy nose after I eat anything. Well, the guy who I wrote about, he was eating two whole bags of cough drops a day. So I don't think you need to worry about it. I don't think that your consumption is that bad. But Venus, tell us why? Why does it hurt to blow your nose and cough? Why? Why? What did you do? It hurts to blow my nose and cough because I girl bossed a little too close to the sun with my roller skating out at the skate park and I ate shit very bad. I was going full speed and ran into the coping, which is where the half pipe meets the deck that you drop in on. And I went full speed with my chest and supermaned that shit and then flew straight back. And Not it was good. a bad time. Yeah. <laughs> so that is how we ended shit show September. Yeah, it was rough. It was a rough month. I am mm -hmm. ready for it to be October. Me too. I'm normally not ready for daylight savings time. However, I think this year I am. I think okay. this year I'm ready for the seasonal anxiety and depression. Oh, you're just going to face it head on. <laughs> I'm trying to be excited for the cold and the fall. If I'm excited about it, I can't be depressed about it, right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> I'll let it I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, I want to be excited for fall too. And I don't know. I just, I like the different kinds of fall that we have because fall doesn't really start in September in Colorado. Like it starts in October and it's fall mm -hmm. for a week and then it snows. Yes, because we typically get snow on or before Halloween. Halloween. Yeah. Yes. And I really just want to appreciate the harvest version of fall before the Halloween version of fall. As much as I love Halloween and I feel so pressured this year to like go full force into Halloween and it's like, but why? Why are you expecting me to have my house decorated on the first weekend of October? I got shit to do. I've been busy. You're very busy. <laughs> you're a very busy and very important person. And <laughs> you're like adulting with the best of them right now. I'm not ready to like have my house decorated for the first weekend of October. It doesn't mean I'm like not excited for Halloween. And that you're not going to decorate in some capacity. Ah, I will. And... Yeah, I'm excited for Halloween, and I chose this episode to be thematically appropriate for Halloween, so I am excited for it. <laughs> I am excited for this episode as well, because <laughs> I feel like I'm already going into it kind of smarty pants. Why is that? Because we did an arsenic part one. So my super smart toxicologist friend already told me all about arsenic. Yeah, I hope I didn't throw people off by saying, like, arsenic part one, and then... They're like, well, where's part two, bitch? Yeah, because it's a heavy hitter. You can't talk about it once. Right. And what I kind of like about heavy hitters like this, like with, with Agent Orange, we did a two-parter. We did Agent Orange mm -hmm. and then the Rainbow Herbicides. And I feel like we could go into maybe more detail, but not much. Yeah. But with Arsenic, I mean, it's been used for centuries. Right. It was one of the Rainbow Herbicides. Right. Which one was it? Was it blue? I think it was blue. I'm pretty sure it was blue. <laughs> so we're here in Arsenic Part 2 mm -hmm. in Season 2. Let's go. So when we left off in Arsenic Part 1, we said that the Marsh test was invented or discovered. And it did change things because you didn't have the Borgias and things like that just poisoning people all the time. But it didn't mean that there was a stop to arsenic poisonings. 
and arsenic was still readily available. We did the microdose on Florence Maybrick, and part of the controversy about that was that she had the arsenical fly papers that she was using as a cosmetic treatment. And the only reason that the flypapers were a thing and that she was being recommended to put arsenic on her face still was because there was still just this kind of ubiquity of arsenic. And so you could get it from the apothecary. It wasn't hidden in the back shelves of a couple of places. Mm -hmm. It was abundant. Yeah, it was around. And laws were being passed following the Marsh test and everything, following the Lafarge case and the introduction of forensic toxicology, because arsenic is super important to forensic toxicology on the whole, because the first instance of forensic toxicology being used in a court case was for the Lafarge arsenic poisoning. And so following all of that, there were laws being passed to limit the availability of arsenic to the public. There was the Sale of Arsenic Regulation Act of 1851 in Great Britain, which age-restricted the purchase of arsenic to people over 21 years old. Okay. So, so, it was around, and it was also still being used medicinally at this point. We had had arsenic that was used medicinally since antiquity, and there was a particularly popular solution called Fowler's solution that was an arsenical anti-malarial. So before we had quinine, we used this Fowler's solution, and it was formulated in 1786, but it remained available for sale into the 20th century. The only reason we stopped using it was because it just declined in popularity once we had quinine and things like that. And what did the Fowler's solution or the quinine do? It was an anti-malarial, so an anti-parasitic. Just, okay, got it. Yeah. If anybody is needing a TLDR about arsenic, arsenic trioxide is the most important because it is the version of arsenic that is actually poisonous to us. Arsenic and mercury are both heavy metals that have inorganic and organic versions, and so one or the other tends to be biologically important in that it can poison us, and the other is just kind of inert. And so arsenic trioxide is the important one, and the LD50 given to rats orally for arsenic trioxide is about 20 milligrams per kilogram. But you can have acute and chronic arsenic poisoning, and so you can have exposure to it over long periods of time. Chronic exposure usually results in cancer, but you can also get some of the symptoms that you get with acute poisoning, like abdominal pain, watery diarrhea, sore throat, cardiovascular disease, cognitive impairment, so it can bring on like a psychosis. And these symptoms, both the acute and the chronic, often mimicked cholera. And so when cholera was still a thing, mm. arsenic was also still readily available. And so there was still this kind of ease of being getting away poisoned. with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because if people are dying from these symptoms, mm -hmm. while well, cholera is a thing, I'm not going to, I mean, I think we said this in arsenic part one, like when you hear hooves, think horse, not zebra. Right. So if everybody's dying of cholera, mm -hmm. why would I think somebody's being poisoned? That is basically where we are. In the 19th century, England was the first modern industrialized nation in the world. Between 1801 and 1851, the population of England and Wales doubled from 9 million to 18 million people. That's wild. Mm -hmm. And most Britons worked in manufacturing, mining, and construction. And those were industries whose percent of the population employed rose from 22 to 40 percent over that 50-year period. So almost half of people were working in these industrialized fields by the middle of the 19th century. As a result of the increase in population and the increase in industrialization, the cities were dirty, they were crowded, many people were living in poverty, thousands of people were living in communal housing that maybe you pay for like a room per night or you pay for part mm. of a room per night. And so there was just mm. lots of, like you were saying, there was lots of communicable diseases. Everybody had cholera, mm -hmm. people were starving because they couldn't afford to pay for somewhere to live and for food and for their children and things like that. Times were tough. Times were tough. And at these times, food patterns were changing as families became more urban and got fewer of their foodstuffs from farmers, the nearby markets, or their neighbors. We weren't quite to mass-produced food yet, but we were still making big batches of food for thousands of people per day, depending on what part of the country you were in. The makers of the food were unfortunately also strapped by inaccessibility and poverty, and so they were using the food supply chain to make capital and would stretch their ingredients with non-food ingredients. 
Oh, no. <laughs> so are you going to make me scared of food? Uh, not in this episode. Squinty eye emoji for our listeners. <laughs> Now, food adulteration has, of course, always occurred in any capitalistic society. But in the Victorian era, the boom of the population alongside the boom in scientific advances led to several serious, widespread instances of poisoning. For instance, in 1816, an act was passed to try to halt poisoning by ingestion of beer by criminalizing the replacement of hops or malt with molasses, honey, cassia, vitriol, grains of paradise, or opium. They would replace the hops and beer with opium because it was cheaper. They're getting fucked up. <laughs> They're getting so fucked up. I mean, this kind of reminds me almost of the heroin fentanyl discussion. And I mean, it might almost even be more important because like 19th century, we're more modern, obviously. We're moving along in time than we have been previously. But like, is beer safer to drink than water still if everybody's getting cholera and shitting in the local well and you know things like that like beer might be the safer choice and so it really is like a public health issue more than anything right. a similar belgian law was passed in 1829 that criminalized the addition of copper sulfate zinc sulfate or quote other poisonous ingredients to bread they just had to make a law because people weren't following don't add poisons to bread I mean, what's the saying? Like, most laws come because somebody fucked it up for everybody else or something like that. Like, like how there's a law like that you can't race a turtle on a Tuesday afternoon on Main Street in Pensacola, Florida. It's one of the like, okay, guys, somebody poisoned the bread. So can we not? This is where we are. But it gets better. It gets better. I just found a list of like, there were two main books that were written at this time, and so, like, it was well known that it was a problem. One of the books listed these contaminants that were found. There was henbane, which is a poisonous nightshade, in the ale. There was lead oxide in the wine, bone ash in the flour, sulfuric acid in the vinegar, chalk in the butter, and browned acorns mixed into ground coffee. Why? <laughs> Why? Is it? Okay. So I'm not the chemist. So isn't sulfuric acid highly corrosive and yeah. like it'll eat through your skin, your face? Like, am I wrong? Yeah. No, no. It's it's definitely a corrosive skin irritant for sure. Like if it was in vinegar, I would be horrified to see Same. who ended up with that. I mean, I love pickled anything. So consider me dead. Well, it's the copper sulfate they were using because it's green, and they were using that to color pickles so that they appeared greener. <gasps> I'm not even kidding. Where it all started. <laughs> Where it all started. Moose, if you're listening, I just thought about you <laughs> with, with the pickle talk. Anyway, that's frightening. Yeah. In 1836, a British law was passed that defined what bread could be made from. Because this was a problem. So there were obviously attempts to curb adulteration. It was a known problem, but it was persistent and it was evasive. And so that brings us to 1858. In 1858, Bradford, West Yorkshire, was a town with no proper sewage system, no pure water supply to houses, streets that wouldn't drain, and many of the streets were unpaved. There were no laws concerning where anyone could build houses or factories in the city, and on top of that, there were no laws that concerned the adulteration of food or drugs in all of Great Britain, aside from, like, you can't make beer with certain things and you can't make bread with certain things. But there was no, like... Don't put poison shit in the food, please. Right. Just specifically bread and beer. Mm-hmm. I like... mean, we've got our staples, at least. <laughs> like, we got all the carbs covered. <laughs> Elizabeth Mary Midgley's grandmother bought two ounces of lozenges on the night of Saturday the 30th October at William Hardacre's stall in the Bradford Green Market. The stall was called Humbug Billy and was a known confectionery, but it was not attended that night by the owner William Hardacre. Instead, it was being attended by a man named John Broadley Edmondson, from whom the grandmother bought the lozenges. Within 10 minutes of eating two lozenges on Sunday the 31st of October, the seven-year-old girl became ill and vomited. Other members of the Midgley family had also become ill, but they recovered. Elizabeth, unfortunately, did not. This is really sad. Already. 
Elizabeth was not the first victim, however, but her illness and death contributed to the growing panic that this was not a spreading communicable disease, but widespread poisoning. The first victims who died were actually 9-year-old Elijah Wright and 14-year-old Joseph Scott, who died suddenly on Saturday night around 11 o'clock after eating the lozenges, but their families initially believed that they had taken sick with cholera. Once it was apparent that the lozenges eaten by all three children and others across the city were the culprits, the Bradford police were informed of the deaths and the chief constable sent officers around the city, ringing bells and alerting people of the poison suites, which were immediately suspected by family members and officials once they had themselves ruled out cholera. All of the sweets which were purchased, but luckily not eaten, were collected by the police, and this resulted in 36 pounds of tainted sweets being collected. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, so if we're thinking like two ounces per person, like an ounce or two, that's a lot of lozenges. On November 5th, three men were arrested for the deaths and the illnesses. Their names were Hodgson, who was a druggist in Shipley, William Goddard, who was a druggist's assistant, and Joseph Neal, who was the confectioner who actually made the lozenges and then sold them to Hardacre for sale at Humbug Billy's. Mm. The surgeon Henry Taylor stated that he was called to the Midgley house and attended to seven-year-old Elizabeth on the evening of October 31st. His assistant actually went that night, and he went the next morning. Both men could attest later in court that the girl was clearly suffering from arsenical poisoning, and the grandmother, father, and mother also had the same symptoms. Taylor would later perform the autopsy on the girl, and although it seemed like he was already positive mm -hmm. that it was arsenic poisoning, his suspicions of an irritant poisoning were confirmed. The lungs, heart, and liver of the girl were all healthy, but he noted a congested and inflamed stomach to include bright red patches of inflammation on the stomach up to the duodenum and down to the small intestine. Mm. And as I was writing this, I was just trying to think what kind of pain that would be. When we talk about abdominal pain, that's just right. kind of general, but it's just like the lining of your entire gastrointestinal tract is swollen Scorched. and irritated. Yeah. It's scorched because it's, it's inflamed. It's pissed mm -hmm. off. Ugh. And he found that her stomach was virtually empty except for bile because she had also been experiencing the horrific purgative effects of arsenic. Right. It's like chicken or the egg. Are you violently throwing up mm -hmm. because you have this poison in you, but now it's affecting the lining? So now your lining is like quaking and losing its mind, you right. know? Like, right. Yeah. That sounds so painful. Yeah. Poor thing. The arsenic in the lozenges was confirmed by an analysis done by the chemist, Mr. Remington. He had also received two other packages of lozenges, which he analyzed. He analyzed some of Hardacre's unsold stock and the confectioner Neal's scotch mixture. So these were just lozenges that had been put in a jar of scotch mixture. And I'm not sure why they did that. I don't know if they were trying to get rid of the lozenges after the fact or what but they were in this jar of scotch mixture so like actual like drinking scotch oh gotcha for gotcha. whatever reason i was imagining like a lozenge that was scotch flavored or something i mean they probably would be scotch flavored but they're like <laughs> probably at that point but they're peppermint lozenges Yo. and like i guess there is peppermint scotch but it just seems like those two things don't go together I mean, I'm not a drinker, so I don't, but those two do, like, I could, like, a butterscotch and scotch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. sounds nice. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, so they were hiding, or we don't know if they were, quote, unquote, hiding what, them. I don't know what they were doing with but these. But they were, the lozenges were not where they would normally be. Yeah. Okay. And what Remington found was that the first lozenge weighed about 43 grains, and I went back and was like, what does this mean? So that's about 2.7 grams. This 2.7 gram lozenge had about 0.9 grams of arsenic. It, uh, so it, a lot. That's yeah, a lot. It was yeah. about a third arsenic. Yeah. And, you know, if the LD50 is about 10 ish, 10, 20 milligrams per kilogram, it's known to be around there for a, an adult. You would only need about 0.8 grams for an adult with one lozenge. <sighs> yeah. What I'm hearing is, is that little Elizabeth did not stand a chance. Elizabeth didn't stand a chance. Elijah didn't stand a chance. None of the children who were impacted stood a chance. Some of the adults are lucky. lucky. Remington was astonished 
by his calculation, he was like a third arsenic. That that can't be right. And so he redid it, which he should have. Like in, in modern times, you would take one lozenge and you'd run like three to five tests on that one. Oh, okay. And then you would continue to repeat that to make sure you're getting the same mm -hmm. results. Consistently, yeah. Got it. Okay. But so he repeated it and he found that another lozenge from the same packet from the afflicted family who gave them the ones that they didn't eat had a similar result of a third arsenic. He also found similar results in hard acres on sold stock. So he was like, this is it and this right. is where it came from. I love this so much because the last episode... <laughs> that we talked about arsenic, arsenic mm -hmm. part one, sex, drugs, and witchcraft. Please go listen to it if you haven't. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> but in that episode, in the beginning, when we were talking about the Borgias and we're talking about Lady Tofana, like we didn't know how much arsenic mm -hmm. was in Aqua Tofana. Right. We didn't know how much, you know, and now here we are talking about very specific numbers mm -hmm. that we're able to test for. And I think that that is just super neat and science is really cool. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> so anyhow, give me more science fun. Well, Remington then analyzed the, the lozenges from the scotch mixture and he didn't find any arsenic in the scotch mixture. So I, I don't really know what he was testing for because I don't understand the scotch mixture and what was going on there. Right. Like, we're clearly not in the age of OSHA and, like, food inspectors. Otherwise, right. this wouldn't have happened. Right. So the whole reason that I bring it up, despite not really understanding what part it played, is that he saw that it was this weird yellow color on the lozenge that he got from the scotch mixture. So he scraped it off mm. and he realized that the yellow color was chromate of lead. So... Arsenic being a semi-metal, is that like a rusting that mm -hmm. was happening? No. So this was a separate contaminant. This was like an additional contaminant that he ran into at this guy's confectionery. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. What, so are we, what do we have behind door number two, Johnny? <laughs> Chromate of lead is yellow, and so it was used to color things like mustard because of its yellow color. And so my understanding is that, like, the lozenges were put in the scotch mixture, something happened, and maybe the scotch had been darkened or ma made yellow with lead chromate. And so there's just, like, further adulteration that they're catching, and then it came off onto the lozenges. So it's just this side thing where it's like, oh, well, that could be dangerous, but, like, it's not the thing we're looking for. We're not here for that, but also, what? Yeah. <laughs> my guy. <laughs> what the fuck is going on in your store? Right. <laughs> Okay, so that was a nice little side quest yeah. that they got to go on. Okay. <laughs> the investigation continues after they're like, this is definitely it, and now we have to, like, retrace our steps to figure out what happened and where this came from. So the man attending the stall, Edmondson, was a yeast dealer who sold spices to William Hardacre. And he told the police, he attested, that he sold four to five pounds of lozenges <sighs> altogether on Saturday night. That's a lot of lozenges. Yeah. especially when just a couple grams would like fuck you up i mean it sounds like at least he's being honest well i mean he didn't know he he did this unknowingly like this isn't a malicious situation right well and i think that they just needed to retrace their steps so they're like who sold you these lozenges right. and they're like oh i was at this stall i was at humbug billy's who was attending humbug billy's edmondson and then they get to edmondson and he's like i don't i'm just what? a yeast dealer and i was just doing a favor for a friend <laughs> right. i don't know anything oh my god and how can we talk about it's not survivor's guilt what would that be i don't even know what you can compare it to because i was thinking like that that stupid philosophy question like there's one person on the track and five person on the tracks what do you do it's right. not even that no, it's because like, you don't know you're going to kill anybody on the tracks. Or no, you know what it's like? Hmm. You know what it's like? Do you remember in the nicotine episode? Do you remember how we had our tiny side quest case of <laughs> the guy who, because he was pissed off at the grocery store, question mark, oh, God, put yes. the nicotine in the ground beef? So to me, it would be like if Patty... Mm -hmm. was selling the ground beef that had mm -hmm. nicotine in it. Like, Patty didn't know. Right. Yeah. You know? So it's kind of like, and also a yeast dealer. Like, that was the <laughs> thing. And I, I like that. Ye olde yeast dealer. Yes. Very old timey. So this poor yeast dealer out here killing kids. I know. And so I think they're like, okay, we can tell you had little to nothing to do with this. And so then they start questioning Neil. 
So Neil told them that his lozenges were made by mixing 52 pounds of sugar, four pounds of edible gum, and one and a half ounces of peppermint essence with some water, and then spreading that paste on a board to dry and cutting it into the lozenge shapes. However, and I'm not sure at what point he revealed this, probably immediately because I don't think that he thought that it was suspicious behavior yet, Neil admitted to stretching his lozenge mixture by replacing 12 pounds of the sugar, which was the most expensive ingredient, no. with, a, with a plaster of Paris or Derbyshire limestone, also called Terra Alba or Daft. So just fucking ground up rocks were replacing some of the sugar. Well, not replacing some. We're replacing 12 pounds. Well, 12 pounds out of 52 pounds. I don't care. 12 <laughs> pounds. I don't care. I'm sorry. Like, I'm not trying to be rude. But 12 pounds is a lot of fucking plaster of Paris that is not sugar. Like, is this plaster of Paris that you make, like, paper mache and, like, mold? Or not paper mache, but you do mold. Yeah. What? Yeah. No. I tried to do Ew. some calculations, and it was all in, like, shillings, and so I had to, like, I had to do a bunch of stuff. This is very Ooh, rough. No, I love, yeah, did you convert shillings to pounds? Shillings to, to pounds, pounds to dollars, yeah. I love you. <laughs> Tell me, how much did we save, Neil? In 2021 money, he saved about 20 pounds or $28. I know. <gasps> I know. <laughs> Neil, I will give you $28. I will Venmo you $28 right now so that you don't use plaster of Paris and you put sugar in the fucking lozenges, Neil. All right. And so then they have to trace back, okay, we got sugar, we got plaster of Paris, well, and yeah, we've does, got- So does that have arsenic in it? No, not usually. Nothing's it, poisonous in this. Nothing it's is poisonous, rocks. yeah. It's still a question of where the fuck did the arsenic come from. Got it. Okay. And so they go back another step. And James Archer, who worked for Neil, was the one who bought the 12 pounds of plaster of Paris that they need, and it was called daft. So he's the one who bought the 12 pounds of daft. And even in 1858, this daft was considered safe in small dosages, but it was known to be injurious in large dosages. So they're, they're, they are side-eyeing him for adulteration, but it's not illegal yet, but it's like, oh, that's well, a dick move. Yeah, yeah, it's not like he's almost being willfully ignorant because you would think that as a confectioner... Mm -hmm. that he would know something is poison. We would like to imagine that the person working at Taco Bell knows how warm the meat should be for it to be safe. I hope so. We would hope so. So he fucked up. He's yeah. putting poisonous shit in. But it's still not enough to kill anybody. Okay. It might be enough to make them sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, depending on how many lozenges mm -hmm. you eat because it's a mm -hmm. third of the lozenge. Right. I mean, this isn't a small amount. But they're still like, I don't think that's it. I don't think that would do it. Mm, and mm -hmm. they were they were pretty sure it was arsenic, too. So I think they knew that they were trying to find arsenic. Something that would... Okay. Right. So we still haven't found it. We're still looking. Archer was actually a lodger for Neil. And so Archer said that he went to buy the daft. He went to Mr. Hodgson's shop at Shipley, the druggist. He bought the daft and he came back and he gave it to this guy... James Appleton, who worked at the confectionery as well. And Appleton was the one who actually made the lozenges. Mm. And Appleton, you know, he didn't say that he added anything else or anything different, but he did say that he felt unwell after making the lozenges. Oh. And he thought that he just had a cold, which I'm like, did you have gastrointestinal distress? Because that's not a cold. Right. Like if we have bubble guts and we're throwing up, that's not a cold. Right. Neil, once the lozenges were made, he thought that the color of the lozenges were off, and he thought that the taste of the lozenges were off, and he became sick himself after trying a lozenge, after Appleton was made sick from making the lozenges, but they still didn't put all their points together, and he was just like, I'm, I don't know, I guess it's fine, the color's off, but whatever. I don't know. Because, I mean, we have a lot of things pointing to something's up with these lozenges, and we're just saying, oh, I don't give a fuck about that. Somebody else will handle that, right? Somebody else will put the dirty clothes in the hamper, right? So then Hardacre, who's the guy who owns Humbug Billy's, he comes by to pick up the lozenges he orders, and he also thinks that the color is off. But he doesn't say, I don't want these. He just says, I won't pay the full price because the color is off. He had enough of a note of it that he is saying, this is not a good enough product for me to give you premium product prices. Mm -hmm. 
but he didn't question the purity still. For whatever reason, the purity was not called into question. He was just like, the color is off, and so I'm not going to pay full price. And Oh, no, stop. And then Don't. Hardacre tried one of the lozenges and became so violently ill <laughs> that he had to go home. And that's the reason he wasn't running Humbug <gasps> Billy that night. No. I'm not kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> mm -hmm. The investigation continues. And at the druggists, they found that the assistant, William Goddard, was directed to get the daft for Neil rather than the druggist himself because Hodgson was sick at the time. Not because he ate a lozenge, he was just sick at the time. He had nothing to do with it up to this point. But poor old Goddard was an 18-year-old assistant at the druggist, not an apprentice. He'd only been there for five weeks. Hodgson had instructed him when the people are coming for the daft. The daft is upstairs in the attic of the shop, and it's in a cask. And Goddard was like, cool, got it. But when he went up there, there were multiple casks. And he pulled out of the wrong cask. And he ended up giving the confectioner's shop 12 pounds of arsenic <gasps> rather than 12 pounds of daft. No. Yes. There was no label on the barrel. When the investigators came back, I think something had been spread word of mouth. People had already done their own investigation to be like, oh, shit, no. that comes back to us. And mm -hmm. they had labels on the bottom, but there were no labels at the time. Like, it was clear that the casks had been moved prior to right. the investigation beginning. Okay, so we at least found the smoking gun. I have so many questions. <laughs> Does 12 pounds of arsenic look like... 12 pounds of daft is my first question. I assume that they're both similar and like white color, but I think there has to be something off about the color because that's what people mm. kept noticing. Oh, right. The because the lozenges off. are not the right color and that's why I'm not going to pay full price for them because I'm going to like old timey Karen out. Excuse me. I'd like to speak to your manager. I will not be paying full price right. for these lozenges because they are not the right color. They mm -hmm. made me poop my pants and throw up everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I can't make it in to sell the lozenges that I'm buying for a discounted price. However. Yep. And so then it was this 12 pounds of arsenic that was used to make 40 pounds of lozenges. 36 pounds were sold on Saturday night and Sunday morning. And within 24 hours of the sale, 225 people had taken ill. I don't know what about the scientific method makes me always think about sample size. Sample size is important. And what well, I mean, maybe it's because everybody does their own research now and doesn't even know how to like read a research paper, but right. sample size is important, everyone. So the 200 and some people, I imagine that there are some people, especially because this is old timey. I mean, do we even have radio right now? I don't think so. So like, what if there are other people who died or got sick that just weren't involved in mm -hmm. the subsequent investigation into it? I mean, I think because of the whole communal living situation that if anybody's just like violently mm -hmm. ill and they think it's cholera, that they're Everybody like- Everybody might know about it. Yeah, they're like, oh, gotcha. we got that guy the fuck out of here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. That so, makes sense. That makes but sense, but there might be more people because, sure. it, you know, what if somebody was just passing through town and got some lozenges on their way back home? Oh. Right. And so that's why I will always say I think that in, in a lot of the cases that we cover, there's probably more people that were affected than not, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard to pin down everybody who was affected. Right. On November 12th, 1858, a magisterial inquiry into the poisoning of more than 220 people by peppermint lozenges was begun. So 12 pounds of arsenic was used to make 40 pounds of lozenges, and that was sold over two days. I mean, in an evening and a morning. As far as we know, 225 people were sick, and how many again died? 20. 20. So this reminds me of, this would have been our first episode. Our first episode, we talked about botulism or botulinum toxin, mm -hmm. which is the most deadly substance in the world. Yeah. The most poisonous substance in the world, right? Yeah. So in that episode, we talk about this hypothetical situation called the Stanford milk experiment. Long story short, there's this really cool chart. I'll post the video again on social media, and it shows how there are so many different places where milk could be poisoned. Mm -hmm. And 
at that point, it's just going to make more and more people sick. So it's kind of like this, but a little different, but same vibe of mass poisonings. Like Mm -hmm. how many ingredients did they use to make these lozenges? Like, well, if the daft, which first of all, shouldn't have been in there. Right. That's why this somewhat feels malicious, not in a, I'm trying to kill you specifically, but it feels negligent. Yeah. So anyway, the daft shouldn't have been there, but let's just even pretend they replaced the sugar with arsenic or they replaced Mm -hmm. the peppermint oil with strychnine or they replaced whatever, like any of these ingredients. Mm Mm-hmm. And even if it would have been a a smaller amount of arsenic, it was still enough that it's going to kill kids and make people really sick. Right. I hope that things get tighter as far as like, yeah, we don't poison more than bread. We don't poison more than beer. (laughs) We also don't poison the lozenges now, guys. Right. And that whole like worry about poisoning and seeing how it had played out accidentally in cases like the Bradford Sweets poisoning is why that theoretical experiment with the milk was even thought about. They were like, this would be terrible. This would affect so many people. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about with how like it feels malicious or at the very least negligent, I think that's why the three men that they arrested, Hodgson, Goddard, and Neil, were arrested and brought to trial because Neil was using daft and he shouldn't have been. And then it was put on an assistant to Which get... Which was Goddard. That was Goddard. It was put Goddard. on him to mm-hmm. get the arsenic. And so there was mm-hmm. negligence on his part. But it was really Hodgson who allowed this newbie assistant to confuse the arsenic for the daft. A, maybe one of the more experienced people mm-hmm. in the shop would have been able to say, oh, this isn't daft, which also isn't sugar. But it's also not arsenic. It's mm-hmm. daft. Whereas this new guy is like, here you go. Yeah, I I found the white powder in the cask. Seems good. And so when they were arrested and brought to at least the preliminary proceedings for the court, Mm -hmm. the jury was of the opinion that they should all three of them be tried for manslaughter. Good. In total, 20 people died from the poisoning. Half of them were children. And they were, mm. they were waiting to see if anybody else was sick, if anybody else died and came forward before they completely finished the court proceedings. Mm. But by the time everything was said and done, all three men were released without facing any punishment. No. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just off the cuff here and maybe out of pocket. Who knows? <laughs> but if Hodgson weren't sick... Maybe this wouldn't have happened. Potentially. Because Hodgson was the owner of the shop, right? Hodgson was the druggist. So he was the one who said, I don't want to pay the right price because these aren't right. Then he ate it and he got sick. Hodgson was the druggist. Hardacre was the one who said these aren't the right color. I won't then pay Then why wasn't price. he tried? Because he had nothing to do with the handling of the arsenic, I guess. He was just the guy <sighs> who bought the lozenges from the confectioner. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, he could have suspected that they were impure, but I don't know if he could have had any legal recourse, even if he thought it was impure. So I don't know how much responsibility he had. Yeah, and it's this weird dilemma because then I also, as a Libra rising, because I'm an astrology hoe, as a Libra rising, I try to be fair and diplomatic and weigh both sides. So, like, there are so many names. I have lost track of which guy is the, like, shittiest (laughs) one of all of these. But the one who went upstairs, the newbie guy, which one was he? Goddard. Goddard. When he went up to go into the cask, he was new. So Uh is he to blame because he was poorly trained and he was left in the shop alone? I feel like the person to blame is Neil, the confectioner. Because he made it. Because he made it. He was replacing the sugar with daft. And there would have never been any confusion about daft or arsenic if he had just been using sugar. sugar. Yeah, if he had just spent the 20 pounds, the seven shillings on fucking sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Neil, you broke ass. (laughs) Cheapskate. I'll say it. Neil's a cheapskate. And so while I'm sitting here and I'm trying to decide what is fair, like, do I think that newbie should have gone to prison or whatever that was like in Britain in the 1800s? I mean, I don't know. I think that the newbie was not trained well. And I don't know how much of that was his fault. Maybe he was trained and he didn't pay attention. 
Yeah, I mean, there's like, things we don't know about that. Right. That so part. I don't know. I don't. My gut with him, even though he's the one who gave the arsenic to him, mm-hmm. I want to say that he's possibly the least culpable. Possibly. Neil is the bad guy. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> Neil, don't save twenty eight dollars. Put sugar in the fucking lozenges, not plaster of Paris. <laughs> you cheap son of a bitch. And Hodgson, I mean, do we want to blame him? He's another one of those people that it's like, just because you were following whatever laws there were, doesn't mean that you couldn't have been doing better. Mm-hmm. Especially because I suppose that a druggist might need to have daft for other things. But mm-hmm. it's kind of that weird, like, back alley handshake where it's like, I know what you're using this for and I'm culpable. See, and that's where it gets interesting, kind of, right? Because it's when you know somebody's doing the wrong thing mm-hmm. and you turn a blind eye. Yeah. Because at one point, it's not my monkeys, not my circus. Mm-hmm. But at the other point, it's like, guy. Well, and he should know what the effects of daft on the body are because he's a druggist. Very good point. If you're one of the more educated in mm-hmm. the group, Maybe you should use that knowledge for good, not yeah. for evil. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for talking that out. <laughs> okay. Of course. Anytime. Who do you think was the most responsible listeners? Tell us who you think. The 1858 Bradford Sweets poisonings, as the incident came to be known, led to the creation of England's 1859 Bill to Regulate the Keeping and Sale of Poisons, and the 1860 Adulteration Act. Yay! Things happened at least. (laughs) And then we never had another mass poisoning from heavy metal ever again. Yay! Of course I'm just kidding. Of course you're just kidding. Because you're Kayla. (laughs) Of course you're just kidding. What happened next? In 1900, 40 years after the Adulteration Act was passed, six thousand people were poisoned in Manchester and 70 died over the course of four months from ingesting arsenic-tainted beer. So we're back with arsenic again even? This isn't even like a new thing? (laughs) This isn't even like a new poison on the block? No, no. I could have chosen a new one, but I I was able to stick with arsenic. (laughs) Well, yeah, and especially when 6,000 people. I Mm -hmm. don't no 6,000 people. Like, if 6,000 people were standing in front of me, like, I'd be freaked out. That's yeah. a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Over four months, usually mass poisonings are figured Caught. out in a couple weeks at tops. Right. Or two days, like the Bradford Sweets poisonings. Right. So it took a while for officials to recognize this case as a mass poisoning incident because many of the exhibit symptoms, paralysis, peripheral neuropathy, gastrointestinal symptoms, were common symptoms of alcoholism. But patrons and brewers alike suspected that something was wrong early on because they were getting things like rashes, which were similar to foot and mouth disease that like babies usually get, and that's not something alcoholics typically end up right. with. And not all of the drinkers were alcoholics or heavy drinkers. One victim was a two-year-old girl who would sometimes be allowed sips of beer by patrons at her father's pub. And (sighs) another was a man who fell off the wagon in Liverpool after six months of sobriety. He drank 36 pints of beer in three days and then two days later developed abdominal pain and peripheral neuropathy, which were both described as severe, but luckily both he and the two-year-old recovered. Two-year-olds were in pubs drinking beer? That's where, like, I got stuck (laughs) mentally? Like, I'm picturing a little two-year-old girl, like, sitting on a bar and patrons giving her, like, rubbing the Buddha belly. You know, like, that's good luck. You give the baby a drink of your beer. Like, it's what you do here. Well, I mean, like, okay, so I've been watching Outlander (laughs) and, like, nobody talked to me about it because I'm only on the second season, so don't talk to me about it. (laughs) But she time travel and shit but she comes from like 1945 i think okay end of the war and she gets pregnant and she's still drinking beer and so like in 1945 we still weren't like aware that you shouldn't drink beer when pregnant yeah so of course give the baby some beer they need to learn to hold their liquor (laughs) right because otherwise they won't be able to handle their 36 pints of arsenic laden beer kayla that's why the babies need to drink their beer (laughs) 
Well, I'm glad that they both recovered. <laughs> it's like, that's great. Okay, so then what happened? Officials decided to test the beer being served at the pubs where people drank, and they were like, there is something off. I got really sick, and I'm not an alcoholic. And a professor named Professor Dixon Mann of Owens College found that the beer contained arsenic. And the source of the arsenic was truly unexpected and accidental. So it was more than the Bradford sweets. Like, this was crazy. There was arsenious acid in the glucose and invert sugar obtained from a sugar refiner in Liverpool, which had been manufactured from raw materials using sulfuric acid, which contained arsenic that was provided by a business in Leeds. So it was this, like, go back a step, go back a step, go right. back a step again. They were like, none of this should have arsenic. I don't understand. Like, where and did so, this come from, even? Right. And so it was the arsenic-containing sulfuric acid that was used to manufacture the glucose. I find it darkly humorous that in both instances that you have chosen, and I don't know <laughs> if you did this on purpose or not, but I do find it darkly humorous that both of them contained not only arsenic, but specifically like a sugar and arsenic combo. <laughs> I did not do that intentionally. <laughs> well, well played. Well played. It's bittersweet, I guess. <laughs> but I'm... <laughs> We're hilarious. So funny. As a result of these compounding contaminations, the analysts determined that five pints of beer would deliver about 40 milligrams of arsenic, which is quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Especially but, when we're having 36 pints. Well, that was beer. over three days, so it would be like 12 a day. Yeah. <sighs> I'm so, sorry, 12 pints seems like a lot. I'm not a drinker. I don't I mean, know if that's normal. It's like less than three, two beer. So like it is a lot. Oh, okay. I'm not saying that like it's not a problem, but it was like kind sure. of weak beer, I think, probably. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That's like they're drinking wine coolers. They're not pounding like Everclear. <laughs> right. Got it. Exactly. Okay. So, and five pints of beer wasn't an uncommon amount to drink for like a working person in a single setting. So they would right. go to the pub after work, they'd have their bread that wasn't supposed to have any arsenic, and they'd have their beer that wasn't supposed to have any arsenic. <laughs> and things just ended up this way. Okay. Oh my god, all the carbs. We've got our beer. All the We've carbs. got our bread. We've got our sugar. Yep. Stop putting arsenic in it. Save the carbs. <laughs> So the findings from the investigation were finalized in 1902 and led to laws with more stringent controls over the amount of arsenic allowed in glycerin, glucose, malt, treacle, and beer, all of which may come in contact with sulfuric acid and heat and could potentially cause the creation of arsenic trioxide or arsenic acid, which are both forms of arsenic dangerous to humans. And that's why the beer in this particular instance was dangerous. Right. It's just because of the sulfuric acid and the heat. And so now we're having to look at individual ingredients and say, we're limiting the amount of arsenic allowed in these. So how much longer before we just said, don't put poison in food, period? It took a while, especially if you're talking about the United States. Oh, good. good. <laughs> because in our episode on thalidomide, we were mm -hmm. able to say like, yeah, we'd already fucked up in a way that nobody else had before. And we had the FDA and we didn't allow thalidomide to come in, you know, through right. the front door because of the FDA. And because uh, Francis Kelsey's a baddie. Hell yeah. But before we didn't, then. We didn't come up with our own act to make sure that foods were pure in the way that the 1860 Adulteration Act did mm. until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. And we talked about that in thalidomide. We did. This we did. was like lots of time, decades <laughs> before. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's not like we weren't having the poisonings either. So it's not like we were like missing things and Britain just right. happened to be the one to fuck up. Like we were having the same sorts of things in 1858, <sighs> same year as the Bradford Sweets mm -hmm. poisonings. There was a swill milk scandal in New York that was responsible for the death of roughly six to 8,000 infants. Oh, um, okay. And Hold on. <laughs> Don't glaze over the six to 8,000 dead babies. I, I feel like you were about to gloss over that. Excuse no, me? no. <laughs> so now we're, this is way worse. This is way worse than the Manchester thing. Yeah, because Cause they're dead. It, yeah, and they're babies. Not that like grown people lives are more important, but like. I mean, it might have what? been glossed over by the people of New York in a way. Like, it's not like it went unnoticed, sure. but sickness was rampant in 1858. Cholera and all the things that we get vaccinated for now. 
Right. And so like, we didn't know what SIDS was. We didn't know like all of these things. Probably we were letting two-year-olds smoke at back then <laughs> for all I know. I've seen pictures that suggest we probably were. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like I'm, I'm being sensationalist and not. But six to 8,000 infants is, that's a big deal. Yeah. And it, it was made into a big deal by, Good. you know, newspapers and by people like that, but it didn't change anything in terms of New York laws or federal um, laws, nothing. It was so, still an issue actually, right up until the creation of the FDA in 1906. Swill milk was still an issue. And I'm so bad with the dates because I really try to stay present in our conversations. And so like, I remember them, but I don't, but so you're telling me that roughly 50 years after thousands, uh -huh. plural, babies died. Oh, we should probably do something about that. Well, and I actually, like, I need to back it up further. I just got so stunned by the deceased babies. What is swill milk? Swill milk is milk that comes from cows that are fed swill. So the residual mash from distilleries. And the milk that comes from these cows is this weird, thin, blue color. And it was thickened with plaster of Paris, starch, and eggs, whatever they had, really. Plaster of Paris making a comeback. Yeah, oh, it was it was popular. It was popular. And then it would be colored with molasses so that people didn't realize how thin the milk was. Like, and that it's it, blue. And then by 1905, they were still doing this. They still had swill milk and they were still thickening it with plaster of Paris. But more and more like bacterial infections were becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. And so this was remedied by adulteration with formaldehyde in the swill milk. And that... That is one of the things that finally led to the creation of the FDA. What the fuck is this? <laughs> so, okay, can we have a swill milk episode? <laughs> we might need to. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like I don't want to overstay our welcome in our listeners' ears. Because mm -hmm. I could, I have so many more questions <laughs> about swill milk. And then we fixed it with formaldehyde. Yep. Very cool. So are there any other crazy ass cases involving arsenic, plaster, of Paris, or sugar that you have up your sleeve at the moment? Not for plaster of Paris or sugar as of yet. Okay. But I mean, arsenic, the next place I wanted to go with this is that like we continue to try to crack down on homicidal poisonings. We continue mm. to try to crack down on accidental poisonings, mm -hmm. but we were still using arsenic industrially and medicinally. And so we still were having homicidal poisonings. We can still always talk about that. But now, currently, in the era that we live in, it's more of an environmental issue. So you had mentioned early in this episode talking about how, like, when you were setting the stage, it was during Britain's Industrial Revolution, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of mining happening and a lot of that going, like, didn't you say before, I think in episode one, that arsenic is naturally occurring in the Earth's crust, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So were miners getting sick from ingesting arsenic during the mining process and like kicking up arsenic dust? That is one of the most common occupational hazards regarding arsenic. We know a lot about inhalational arsenic because of mining and because Interesting. of industrial. Yeah. So we still have more ground to cover with this is arsenic one that we could never really run out of cases for? As far as the like overarching historical story that we're telling, we will eventually come to modern times, but arsenic it is a fan favorite. And so like there are several more normie poisonings that I could talk about. Not, okay. not all these, I keep doing these like mass poisonings this season and like systemic poisonings and... I hope everybody's on board with that. Yeah, tell us if you're not on board because I love it, but I, I'm also not our whole audience. So <laughs> tell us what you think. Has yeah. it been too heavy? Yeah. Has it been too weird? Do you want more like single person cases? Questions, okay. comments, concerns? And if it hasn't been weird enough, come find us on Patreon because it gets weird over there. This episode's coming out after movie night, question mark? It is, yep. But guys, we do movie nights over on Patreon and it's getting weird. Like we're <laughs> about to watch this crazy movie called Audition mm -hmm. and Kayla and I had to have a talk about like, I think this movie's one big content warning. Yeah, so it basically is. buckle up because I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's messed. 
Yeah. So I'm ready. So if you want to get weird, you want to talk about even scarier shit and watch movies with us, mm -hmm. come over to Patreon. Well, and we have some, I mean, I'm planning some like modern food safety stuff for our next mm. microdose in November because November when you're, you know, sitting down to Thanksgiving or whatever mm. you want to call the holiday where you stuff your face and have the day off, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to make you feel real weird about food around that time. Good. <laughs> you make me feel so good about so many things. So I can't wait. I can't wait to worry more in the kitchen. We hope that you guys liked this episode and that you found it thematic enough because it did actually happen. Like the death started to be reported on Halloween 1858. So uh, happy Halloween from happy Lethal Dose Halloween. Podcast. Happy Halloween. Usually people don't poison candy on yes. purpose. Well, and that's the point of why I chose this one is because it was poisoned candy, but it's such a rarity. Like it's usually like the dad poisoning his own kids and shit. People are not giving away their weed gummies. People are not giving away their weed gummies, period. <laughs> if you're giving away weed gummies. Why'd you pay taxes on something like that just to I, give it away for free? <laughs> I know. Like, I don't get it. So that's not a thing. It's an urban legend and a, like a boring and stupid one. Yeah. But accidental poisonings. Yeah. Because food yes. adulteration laws weren't in place. Totally yes. a thing. So stay safe out there. Happy Halloween. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe, and remember, the dose makes the poison.